Hi, everyone. Hello, WebCamp. My name is Senko. I work at a company called Good Code. We are located here in Zagreb, and we are a software development company, and we're building uh, web applications for clients all over the world, and our products are being used by hundreds of thousands of users worldwide. But building a good web application or a great web application is only a first step in a long journey. After it is deployed, after it's running, you also want to ensure that it's running all the time, or at least most of the time. Uh, th so this is what this talk is about. Uh, my aim in this talk is to uh, tell you why you should try to build and organize your web application so it's running all the time or most of the time, so to maximize your, your web application uptime and minimize the unexpected errors and failures. And I'm going to try to convince you why it matters. So this talk is pretty much geared towards smaller outfits, smaller companies, smaller sites, smaller projects. So if you are running, uh, if you're working in Google and managing a fleet of thousands of servers and serving billions of users, you won't find anything exciting and new here. But on the other hand, if you're a developer that's working on a web application that's on a one or a couple of servers, I hope to give you some useful tips and suggestions on how to maximize uh, your uh, service uptime. So once upon a time, life for us software developers was very easy. We only had to uh, get the final release built out of the doors, and that was it. Our worries were over until the next version. But nowadays, uh, things are very different. Nowadays, we have to build web applications, and they have to be online and available all the time, unless uh, if that doesn't happen, your users can't use your application. Even for native apps, for mobile apps, they mostly connect to services that are running uh, on the somewhere in the cloud that are expected to run 24-7. So if a backend service or a web application isn't available, your, your users suffer and your project suffers. So we have to take good care of our service and of our web applications. But on smaller projects, in smaller companies, there probably isn't a dedicated person or a team that's doing this. So this falls to you as a web developer, so it's your responsibility and you're on call basically all the time. It doesn't matter if you're on a vacation, if you're in a wedding or in a hospital, the problems just happen and you have to deal with it. Either you put, you put a stop on your life and then go and fix the problem, or you ignore the problem and then you, have, you provide a lousy service to your users. Or you hit some kind of balance and then both your project and your life suffer. But you know, it doesn't really, really need to be this way. With a bit of foresight, with a bit of uh, thinking and planning ahead, you can try to set up your web, uh, web application and to deploy your services in a way that, are, that will make them a bit more robust. So we don't aim for 100% availability here. The, the, the idea is just to make them a bit more resilient so uh, they can like, limp and serve users in, in some maybe degraded manner until you get to work on Monday and then you can fix things without panicking a lot. So how can we do that? Well, the easiest, things, the easiest thing that you can do is to just shift the responsibility to somebody else. So if, in, if you can do that, you can use shared hosting, you can use a platform <coughs> provider, you can let them worry about the network, the software, the hardware failures, and then forget about it. We have a small application running on Heroku, and it's been running there for two, two years without us ever touching it. It was down a few times, but Heroku just automatically fixed the problem in the sense that uh, they rebooted the application. So this is a great thing. But on the other hand, this only works if your application or how, are you, how you organized your web service is compatible with how the platform works. So the way Heroku works is different from the way that Azure works, is different from the way that the Google Cloud Platform works, and so on. So some things are really hard or even impossible or very expensive to do if you try to do them uh, using the platform provider. But on the other hand, you really don't want to be managing your own hardware, so your own uh, this bare metal servers, and be responsible for them. You really don't want to be woken up in the middle of the night because the disk array failed, and then you have to scramble and, and do stuff. 
remember, you're not a dedicated <laughs> ops team in, in, in that project. You're just a developer, right? So on the other hand, you can try to just shift all the responsibility, responsibility to somebody else. Uh, you don't want to like, work on a bare metal hardware, but you can use either managed or virtual service source or VPS, so you get some isolation from the network and hardware problems, and you still deal with the operating system, but this gives you the flexibility to, uh, to set up and organize your application infrastructure the way you want it. So, because this talk is actually about building such, such a cluster, let's, let's dive in. First, let's have a look at what your application probably looks like at, at the moment. You probably have one server, and you have your application code running on it. It accesses the database. Maybe it stores or loads or manages uh, files on a local disk. And you have users uh, accessing it from the internet. These users might be uh, using web browsers, or these users might be native apps that are accessing your API. The say this situation is the same. Every component in this graph can fail at any time. So basically what you want is to duplicate every, each, each and every one of them and hope it works. But you can't just naively duplicate the server and call it a day. First, you have to, now you have uh, two problems, right? Uh, first, you have to uh, somehow manage the state in the distributed setting. So you want to make sure that the master se server and the slave server have, e uh, have identical or similar copy, uh, state of the, of the data in the system so that uh, the slave can take over if the master fails. You also, want to, uh, make you also want, uh, need to tell the clients which server to connect to. So the master, if it's all right, and if the master fails, you want them to connect to the slave. And also, you want to do this automatically. So uh, if you have to get to your computer and then reconfigure DNS or some config files when the master fails, it's not really a failover. failover. It's, again, you doing the system administration tasks at, at 3 a.m. in the morning or skipping your wedding or something like that. So we want to automate these things. Uh, let's start from the beginning or from, from the left. Uh, let's start with seeing how we can uh, tell the clients which server we need to connect to. There's two easy ways to do that. The first and the easiest way is to uh, take advantage of DNS. So DNS has something called a CNAME record, which is basically an alias for other, uh, for other names. So you have two machines, master and a slave, and in the DNS you can set up your uh, websites or web apps URL or the, the, the name of the machine to be an alias for the master. Then, if the master server fails, you just update this CNAME record and, it will po and point it to the slave instead. One uh, significant uh, aspect of this is that DNS records have something called the time to live or time uh, in which the clients can cache the results. Uh, the minimum practical time you can set is uh, five minutes. In theory, you could set it to lower, but then some clients misbehave. So this means that after you update your CNAME to the slave, some clients for the next five minutes will still try to connect to the master because they have the old result. So this looks or this sounds maybe like a huge window of, of downtime, but remember that if you do it automatically, you're still faster than you would be if you got the page on your mobile phone or uh, to, to run to your computer and then log in and try to fix things manually. So five minutes, and we're speaking about high availability on a budget, five minutes is not necessarily a bad thing. If five minutes is still too long, you can use a reverse proxy. So a reverse proxy is basically a server that sits in front of your real servers, uh, gets the, uh, the request from the clients, and then uh, forwards those requests to your master or to the slave server. But then, again, you have a problem. What if this <coughs> server fails? What happens then? Then, again, you, your entire infrastructure is down. Uh, the idea here is that the reverse proxy is running a much, uh, much more robust software, or much less is happening on those servers. So uh, a great uh, open source uh, software for reverse proxying is Hot Proxy, which is high availability proxy, and Nginx. 
they're often used in these scenarios, they are pretty robust, and chances of them as software failing are pretty slim. But still, the, the server itself, the hardware can fail, and in that case, you have to, again, fix things manually. Or you can combine the two, and then have two reverse proxies, which have uh, uh, and have CNAME records pointing to them, and then have the CNAME updated automatically. And this gives you pretty reliable service, but it, 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 it increases complexity. So with, with each server you, you add, with each layer you add, you increase the chances of something getting wrong. So uh, my advice here would be to keep it simple to use DNS uh, if uh, possible, and then if, if, if it doesn't work well enough for you, then research other alternatives. And one key aspect here also is that you want to update the DNS automatically. For this, you want to be using DNS provider that gives you an API, so you can write a script that pings the master, and if it fails, uh, uses the DNS API to, to change the record. One separate but uh, feature that is also often uh, mentioned or used or combined with reverse proxying or with uh, uh, help high availability in general is load balancing. So if you already have not one but two or more servers, it would be a shame for the slave service to just do nothing and sit and maybe once in a year when your master fails, the server will take over. So it's unused capacity. Let's try to use that. Uh, again, in the first step where we have uh, routing of incoming traffic from the clients, we can again use uh, DNS and its feature called uh, round robin DNS, which is basically having two CNAME records uh, that point one alias www example come to both master and the slave. Uh, about half of the queries from the from the clients will then go to master and half of them will go to the slave. And again, if your master fails, you update automatically the CNAME records to point just to the slave. But you have to be careful here. If the slave fails, you also have to update the CNAME records to point to the master. So this load balancing adds a bit more work for you than just failover would do. Uh, if you're using a reverse proxy for load, uh, for high availability, you can also use it for load balancing. It's actually incredibly easy to do so. Uh, you just, to your existing configuration, you just add another upstream server, one or two or ten. So the situation in the, let's say, in the front or in the handling, uh, getting and handling, uh, forwarding the uh, client requests is pretty easy compared to the rest. And the rest is managing the state in the distributed system. So this is actually quite complex topics, and you, can, you, can, you, can, you could produce hundreds of talks on how best to do that or how not to do that and so on. But we're keep, keeping it simple here, and we're on a budget. So instead of having a really a hugely distributed system, uh, which works 100% of the time, uh, we'll just say, OK, all the data is actually just stored on the, on the master. And Every instance of the web application needs to go to the master database to, uh, to store or retrieve records. And then the slave database only connects to the master, grabs the new updates, and waits. So it doesn't use the resources of your servers as well as purely, like, ideally distributed <coughs> system would. But it's pretty, pretty good, and it's much, much easier to do than really a um, totally decentralized system. You also have to worry about local files. Remember that probably your application handles file uploads from your users, be it uh, profile pictures or media files and so on. And if they are only on one, on one uh, computer, if that uh, server crashes, on your slave you won't have these files anymore. You could um, invent or use some complicated scheme in which these two uh, disks are synchronized don't use NFS for this. NFS is not a good uh, way to handle the uh, failures in a network system. Uh, but uh, an easy and uh, rather cheap way that I always advertise is just use Amazon S3. Amazon is, uh, S3 is really re reliable. It's, it's not going to cost you more than a few bucks 
unless you're ha having terabytes of data there. So just store your media files on the, on the S3, store the data that you have in the database on a master and have it replicated on a slave. And you will uh, avoid relying on any single server in the, in the setup to have just one copy of, of one data. So once you have this, you really want to, what you want to do is uh, when the master database fails, you want to switch all the applications to the slave database. Now this can be tricky. Some databases have built-in support for this, for example, MongoDB. Uh, MongoDB client libraries know to connect to the slave immediately if the master fails. Some databases have third-party or second-party uh, tools to achieve this. For example, for Postgres, there are, there are PG Bouncer and PG Pool. Uh, but if your database uh, is not, uh, your, if your database client libraries don't support it, an easy way to do this is just to let your web application crash and rely on some supervisor process to restart it. And then when, the database, when your uh, web application is restarted, in its, initiali its initialization sequence, they, uh, it should pick up the new database server. So instead of handling uh, what happens in the middle of transaction if one server fails, you just crash the entire application, and then reload it, and it should pick up uh, the, new, the new database master. Uh, one important aspect here is to actually have the supervisor process that runs and resorts and monitors your application. If you don't have this, then when your application crashes, there's nobody else to, to restart it, and then you're back to manual processing. And this sounds really obvious, and it's obvious for me, and I did exactly this problem uh, a couple of uh, years ago, where I just started manually the application from, from the screen process in the, in the terminal, terminal uh, forgot about it, and a couple of weeks or months later, the application crashed, and it never went back up because there was nobody there to, to restart it. So use your open, operating system facilities, be it um, Upstart or Systemd or a Supervisor, to restart your web application instance when it fails. And take advantage of that to just reconfigure it to, to point to the, to the new database. Uh, master. How exactly to achieve uh, replication for the database is, of course, dependent on which database you use. So I'm going to uh, go through a few of the very popular databases and uh, mention key ideas or key tools that you can use. So the idea here is not to show you the configuration file and tell you exactly how to do that but just to give you a few pointers, a few uh, keywords to Google for, to uh, be able to research what to use for your preferred database. For, for Postgres, you will likely uh, uh, want to use something that's called warm standby slave with streaming repl replication. Basically, what this means is that you have a second instance of the Postgres database server, which acts as a slave, doesn't, do, doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, respond to any queries from the, from the web application. It just gets all the new uh, updates from the master that's using uh, streaming replication. And then when the master fails, the server will become the new master. This, fail, uh, this failover and monitoring of the health of the master database is not built in in Postgres, but you can use a great tool that's actually officially recommended called, uh, called Replication Manager, which, uh, handles, which handles monitoring the database master for the, whether it works correctly, and then if not, it can promote the slave to, to be the, become the new master. And also something that I haven't touched on uh, previously, is when your master fails, the slave becomes the new master. Afterwards, when you fix the problem, you want to uh, boot up the old master as a new slave. So re a replication manager tool uh, in context of Postgres allows you to do that. The situation is pretty similar for MySQL. Uh, you want to be using relatively new version of MySQL for this, uh, 5.6 uh, onwards, I think. So we want to be using row-based row replication with global transaction identifiers. So previously, the way that MySQL replication worked is just 
the master shipped the binary log of all the all all the queries to the to the to the to the slave. But this this wasn't really a, a good way for doing this. So in recent versions, MySQL associates um, unique identifier to each transaction, and then transactions are uh, replicated on slave on uh, on the on the transaction by transaction basis. So it's more robust and it works works better and it's more more performant. And MySQL has an additional tool called MySQL Failover, uh, which again provides automatic health check for your database master and can do the failover so it can promote uh, it can promote the slave to master. MongoDB is uh, probably the most hyped uh, NoSQL database out there, and in recent versions it's become actually quite okay. Uh, one great aspect of MongoDB here is it supports replication out of the box. It actually works pretty good. So you have, uh, you, you want to use a feature called replica sets. Uh, basically, you, when you first set up your master, you tell it it's a master for, the rep for, for a new replica set. You initialize the replica set on the master, and then you just add the, the slaves via yeah, one, one line command. And MongoDB will automatically handle failover and monitor, health, health check, check monitoring and so on. Also, if you use a new enough client library for MongoDB, uh, the client library will know uh, how to fail over to the master if, the, if uh, sorry, how to fail over to the slave if the master fails. And also, if you add more servers later, servers later on to the cluster, the, the client library will know that they are also available as, as slaves. Redis is also very popular in memory database. Some maybe wouldn't consider it a, it a database, but it's really, really great tool for various tasks. You should all be using Redis. It's, it's awesome. Uh, Redis supports basically two ways for doing uh, master-slave replication. The old way is using slave off command, where on the slave you just say, on, on the s s database that should be the slave, you just say slave off master. But it doesn't uh, have built-in failover and health monitoring. For that, you have to use another tool provided by Redis called Sentinel. So when you set up all these uh, extra processes, it can be a bit, uh, the process to, to do that is a bit involved. And there's also, from this year, uh, starting this year, is production ready, something called Redis cluster, which allows sharding and better failover, failover options. And of course, uh, the, like from the start of this talk, I've been uh, telling that it's on a budget. It's not a fully like, web scale, internet Google scale ready uh, way to deploy things. It's just a way to uh, increase a bit your availability. So we're not aiming for much. And I was, with, with this table that you can see behind me, I was trying to, to show that Building something like this doesn't necessarily involve huge sums of money. So these are actually the cheapest possible options on, the, on each of the <coughs> provided that I've listed. Uh, DigitalOcean and Linode are popular uh, VPS providers that uh, we've had pretty good experience with. And uh, the prices listed there are their cheapest options. So if you're, if you're doing something more involved, if you need more memory and more disk, you're probably going to use more... Um, bigger servers and maybe we'll pay more, pay, pay more. But the idea is that y having a higher availability setup won't cost you your kidneys. Uh, and I also uh, put uh, some estimates on how equivalently budget application would cost on Heroku, Azure, or Google Cloud Platform. And also for comparison, S3 is really, really, really cheap. Uh, what I haven't touched on uh, at all is using the other Amazon Web Services to build your highly available application. You can certainly do that, and you can certainly build something that's really highly available in the sense that if half the internet connects to your servers, uh, it will work. And it's going to be pretty complicated, and it's going to cost you a lot. So it's, it's a high availability, but not on a budget option. Uh, there are also a lot of things that I haven't at all co uh, covered so far. So, so far, I've, I've tried to like, point you in the right direction, 
But there's once you get from one server to multiple servers, all different kinds of questions, how to do this and how to do that, crop up. So the situation really gets, gets more complicated. For example, I really need to stress that if you're doing this kind of setup, if you have a slave for the master server, this doesn't mean that you don't need backup. You still need backup. Why? Uh, simple example, uh, if you have the master and slave set up and do drop database on master, the slave would replicate it in, in a matter of seconds, and then you don't have any data anymore. So use backups. Uh, what master slave setup can help with regards to backups is you can do the backup operation on the slave. So your master doesn't get affected, uh, doesn't uh, have lower performance while you're doing the backup. So uh, master just serves the queries from the, from the internet, and the slave gets some performance uh, impact because the database is being dumped on a slave or something like that. But it doesn't affect your performance towards the, the actual client. Also, I haven't talked about crash recovery. So this is the the time on, on Monday morning when you come to the job and you're happy because you didn't have to go in there in the middle of the night on the weekend. But still, once you're there, you want to fix the system how, somehow. You want to bring the old server online, and you probably want to say that the old slave is now the master or something like that. This is highly dependent on exactly what you're doing, what database you're using, and so on. Maybe you'll want to again, uh, make the slave server a slave because maybe it's, uh, maybe it's uh, not as uh, big or performance server as the master was. Maybe you will want to actually treat the sl slave server as a master from now on and the old master will be slave and so on. But there, it's still, the job is not done un until, again, you have two servers back online, right? So if the master uh, crashes and then the slaves happily work, don't just leave it at that, because next time something crashes, that will be the server, uh, the slave, and you won't have the, like, the backup for that. Also, logging. So once you get from one server to multiple servers, some of your logs are on one server, some of, of your logs are on another server, and then it's much, easy, uh, much harder to see what's going on if you're just logging in and then inspecting the files and browsing through the disk. So you, You'll want to have some sort of system that uh, brings all the logs to, to the same place and then easily inspect them from there. For example, you could set up a logging server on the slave and have both master and the slave send the logs there. Or, or you could use a third-party service that uses that and so on. So it, again, depends on what exactly you want to do and which tools you prefer to, prefer to use. So uh, this talk, um, the idea for this talk came from the service that we uh, built and we are running uh, that's called a web whiteboard, which is a web-based whiteboarding tool that lots of people want to use. But uh, while building this, we want to make sure that really, really, really small performance or uptime impact in, in case that it crashes and we're somewhere on a vacation. So we built an elaborate scheme with uh, three servers and do, did the, the failover thing and tested it and crashed the servers in, uh, in production and everything worked great. And then the entire Linode you know, data center lost power and then all the servers just went down and again, we, had, we didn't, like this highly elaborate setup did nothing for us. So, what you want to be using, if at all possible, is servers, either virtual or physical, whatever you use, in the different data centers or in the different, different availability zones. Why we did not do that for Linode is because we use their load balancer, which requires all the servers to be in the same data center. So, yeah. But if, if, you, if you can manage to have the master and server in different data centers, but still close enough so that the communication between them is not a problem, that's much better than having all the eggs in one basket, obviously. Uh, one interesting tool that when you, when, you, when you look at how the big players do that who treat the uptime problem even more, uh, more carefully, uh, for example, what Netflix does is they have a, a company culture or development culture that recognizes that 
failures will happen in production all the time, and to uh, to avoid to avoid uh, people accidentally uh, creating a single point of failure, uh, they have a service called uh, Chaos Monkey, which just randomly kills the service in production, and everything should work as normally. And recently, I think they introduced a service called uh, a tool called Chaos Gorilla or Chaos Kong, something like that, which kills all Netflix servers in the same data center. Again, to, to, to make sure that nobody will accidentally put uh, both master and a slave or all the replicas in the same data center. So, you know, it, this, this, this is a topic where you can go from uh, some simple, let's say, duct taped uh, uh, configuration, duct taped setups to something that's, uh, that, uh, that's really global and which, which is really, really hard engineering problem. Uh, but this, this is all uh, a function of how much the downtime affects you. So if you're perfectly fine with having your server crash in, on Friday and then you come in on Monday and fix it, then you don't need to, to do this and you don't need to complicate your life with this. If you kind of really wanted to, to be a bit more resilient, then you can implement something like this and it won't cost you much. If you're bleeding thousands of dollars every minute of your server being downtime, then don't listen to me, but listen to the guys at Netflix or Google who are going to tell you much like, more, much better and more complex ways of doing the same thing. So again, uh, the, the idea is not to have 100% availability. The idea is to, to come as close to it as you need, and just have the, 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 the thing here is that you want to have like peace of mind or some security against panic mode and scrambling to fix something when it crashes. So uh, it really depends on what you want to use and how you want to use it. it really depends on how sensitive you are you are to to the service crashing. Thank you. So I think we have an extended uh, period for Q&A now. So who has questions? Yeah. Someone over there. I guess our, yeah. one of our audio guys, maybe? So during the, the database uh, points, you mentioned MongoDB and Redis, uh, which are document store and key value store. Have you tried uh, Couchbase, which is both document and key value store? And small disclaimer, I work at Couchbase. So did you try it? Sorry, could you, you, could you repeat the question? I didn't quite get it. Did you consider trying Couchbase as an OSQL key value and document store? Sorry, which one? Couchbase. Ah, Couchbase. Couchbase. Sorry, yeah. Couchbase uh, I, I, I didn't use it, so I, I wouldn't know um, what are good or bad, uh, bad points. But a lot of these NoSQL databases or these databases that are roughly could be put in NoSQL uh, basket uh, do put much more uh, focus on the, the higher availability or on the fault tolerance and on the replication than the, let's say, old school databases like Postgres or MySQL. Uh, but again, again, because of that, they maybe are um, worse off in other respects. And, uh, the ideal example here is Mongo, which was really hyped in one aspect, but then really didn't put as much of engineering into, into others. So. Hey, uh, in the slide where you show the final result, I only saw connections to the, to the master. Would you recommend in this phase of on a budget that you offload read queries to the slave? That's a great question. I forgot about that. Uh, I forgot about talking about that. So, uh, yeah, if you're just using the master database, then your slave database is just not using the server capacity. It would be, it's possible to just redirect the read-only read queries to the slave, but then what happens if you have a state-changing query on the master, and then immediately afterwards you have something that depends on that previous query that happens on the slave? So, yes, synchronous replication. So you have to be much more careful about how you handle that situation. If you use synchronous replication, that means your master is slower. 
you want that? Do you not want that? So it's, it's, it's a trade-off. So I was going here for the simplest possible thing that could possibly work, and it's just using the master. But uh, it, one, another, another um, way that that could work, perhaps, is to always put, it's kind of cheating, to always put uh, forward the same client to the same application instance. So you, you somehow pin the, the, the client request on per use. So for example, uh, every user always gets to the same server if uh, everybody is, is, if all servers are, are available. So uh, maybe uh, you don't care about other users getting a bit stale information. Or you can use synchronous replication and avoid this, but then your master is slower. It's, it's straight up. Yeah. Any other questions? This will be an awkward 15 minutes while we just stare at you. Crickets. Who here actually uh, has servers there's, that there's a have question. backed up, backed up uh, uh, systems like this? Does anyone do this? Five people, ten people. Okay. So, uh, uh, yeah, sure. Uh, uh, I have noticed that uh, all the providers you have mentioned are actually VPS providers, like you know, the, so, Sorry. The, uh, all the providers that you have mentioned yeah. are actually VPS providers, uh, like Linode and uh, I don't know uh, DigitalOcean. Yeah. So yeah. they don't provide uh, dedicated uh, hardware, yeah. bare metal stuff. Yeah. Uh, do you have any experiences with with budget uh, uh, dedicated server providers like Hetzner or yeah, OVH or? Similar. Uh, we've used Hetzner previously, and they're great. So if you want a dedicated, unmanaged or managed servers, I think Hetzner is a very good, very good choice. For managed servers, uh, I'd probably recommend Rackspace as well. I'm not sure whether they're a budget solution or not, but they're they're good. But mainly for the reasons of isola isolation from hardware, I like virtual servers, servers uh, better than the dedicated ones. Although the price performance is better for the dedicated servers. Uh, hi, I just wanted to add one thing. Instead of running running your own DNS servers, there are DNS providers that do the health checks automatically for you and switch the IP addresses if you co configure it like this. And the prices are kind of like the same as running two DNS servers on DigitalOcean. Mm -hmm. So I, I didn't uh, I didn't mean that you would run your own DNS servers. You would use the DNS, the feature of DNS that CNAME is easy to, to just point to another direction. And you would use the API those service providers can, can do for you to, to update the, the CNAME record as needed. Or, of course, as you said, there are, pro, there are uh, providers that do the entire load balancing thing for you. Uh, we've had experience with Node, with Node, uh, Linode balancers, and I wouldn't recommend it because we had a data center level crash and uh, the entire setup crashed. There's a typical example also is Amazon's ELB, Elastic Load Balancing Service. If you're using EC2, you can use that. And yeah. Uh, hi. Uh, did you consider changing the IP addresses instead of DNS names if your servers are on the same data center? Uh, yeah. Psh. Well, it basically, it's so uh, changing the IP address instead of CNAME, or using uh, or changing the A record just to to. to point yes, to uh, it it would be much faster because you won't have to wait for TTL. So uh, uh, all the records have TTL, so you cannot avoid that. So if you are for cl for simplicity sake, I didn't put the TTL on the A records there, but all the NS records. Have some kind of built-in uh, TTL that you can set up in, in the DNS server. So, oh, change the, the oh you mean uh, IP takeover? Okay, yeah. So I haven't seen. So the question was: instead of doing all this magic with DNS, why not just the slave take over the IP of the of the master? Um, no, uh, no uh, VPS provider that I've seen allows this feature. If you're using dedicated servers, uh, you can, on some uh, providers, you can uh, get the available, uh, the, the, the feature of, uh, you can like, steal the IP of one server with another, uh, but then you have to manage your own servers. So I was, I 
not keen on pursuing pursuing that. But yes, this al this allows you to just basically instantly switch between master master and the server. And also, when you do IP takeover, that means that the things that are declare you have things that are declaring themselves master instead of having a central thing that universally defines what it is. If you have things doing IP takeover, you need to coordinate so you don't get like two things that, are, that at the same time decide that they're going to take over and so on and so on. It gets a lot more complex. When you have DNS, you have a single point of truth. So don't do that. I actually, uh, once, once upon a time, I was working on a project that actually did use this, and I think to a good effect. So it used a combination of the IP failover, it used a tool called uh, Hardbit, and uh, and a few other like, tools to, to automate this stuff. So I think that Harbit and some other tools, like, th there are existing tools that you can use to minimize the problems of this. But yeah, like, um, shared state and uh, consistency in distributed setting is it's always hard. Let's go shopping. Yeah. Uh, the, qu the question, uh, why did you put hub proxy on a separate server? And not two instances, one on master and then one on slave. Yeah. And then so avoid mm -hmm. the whole, put the both on in A or C name records. Uh, yeah, sure. So the question was, why not putting uh, reverse proxy on both master and the slave and use DNS in conjunction with this? So my concern here is that. A master is running like all kinds of stuff. It runs your web application, it runs the database, it runs the queue, it runs the background process, uh, process and so on. And each of these things can maybe overload or crash the system. And if the system crashes, your reverse proxy crashes as well. Uh, and if the machine becomes overloaded, the reverse proxy will also come, become overloaded and won't be able to reroute to, to the slave. So you get less benefit by putting the reverse proxy on the master and slave compared to putting it in front. But here, reverse proxy, by reverse proxy, I don't mean uh, something, a web server that will uh, just serve your static and then uh, forward the, the app request to, to Rails or Django app. It's more in uh, this kind of server will forward all the requests to the upstreams and only have to worry about routing to the, to the alive servers. So there's a lot less code, lots less things to worry about, lots less, a lot less things to crash. So that's why you would want to put it on, a, on another machine. And of course, if the actual uh, hardware or the, or, or the operating system crashes on master or the slave, you don't want the reverse proxy to be affected by it. You want <coughs> it to be able to route around it. But yes, you can use this in combination with DNS round robin to make sure that you don't have a single point of failure. Another question here. Mm -hmm. uh, hi, uh, all your solutions need monitoring to work to be automated. What if uh, the monitoring service is a point of failure? So which monitoring you, uh, service to use or how to set up health monitoring, right? Yeah, okay. Uh, the simplest thing that you could do is to write a small shell script or a small rail, uh, Ruby or a small Python script that runs on a slave and then gets the landing page from the master or whichever way is the best to, to check the availability uh, on the master and then to do a switch if something happens. Uh, this is a very crude way of doing it. There's a lot of tools that, uh, that can monitor, monitor the health of something in the system and then uh, either alert you or run programs to, to, to do something when, when the situation happens. I think the, like, the small shell script that you can run from cron is, uh, is a crude but effective solution in this case. Also, a related problem, maybe, which you also had in mind, is uh, if you have the checks run locally, uh, how do you know that the master and the slave and the entire setup is actually reachable from the outside world? 
Uh, instead, you could use uh, some third-party service to, to ping you when the, when the site is down, when the service is down. So, uh, yes, you could do that. It all depends on how exactly you want to organize the, the stuff. Uh, Pingdom is, is, is okay, uh, stat, status cake is okay. I don't know, I've always, uh, always used them just to, to ping me, not the, another server to tell it to do something. So I don't have experience in using them to automate some stuff, but only for monitoring or uh, stuff like Moonin or stuff like, um, yeah, Moonin, which like, can show you the load average of the system and number of requests and so on. I've always used those just to, to, to tell me what's happening or to tell the, the, a person what's happening, not to automate stuff. Maybe one thing to, to also mention here is that if you know how to set up a web server, if you know how to set up a database server and so on, if this is easy for you, if you already have the skills in-house, then uh, setting up a cluster like this won't pose a big challenge. But if you uh, don't want to think about it, if you don't, if you'd have to learn it, if you'd have to hire somebody to do it for you, then it becomes the expensive option. And in, in that case, it's better to use the platform provider, maybe configure or uh, reconfigure your applications so that you can use Heroku or some other or shared hosting. Because uh, if you have to learn this, you'll make mistakes. You'll uh, spend more time and more money on, on setting up this instead of using a platform that already provides you with these features. But if you know what you're doing, if you're not just developer but also like and know the operational uh, side of things, then this becomes more flexible and probably cheaper option than going with Heroku or, or Azure and so on. <laughs> 